Hello, everybody. My name is Glenn Taylor. I'm glad you could be with us today for our Bible study. We'll continue our series of lessons from the book of Hebrews today with our ninth lesson. And Lord willing, well, there'll be a total of 13 of these when we complete this study. So I'm so glad that we can be together today. I'm glad for this medium of uh, technology here and online that we can uh, we can have these lessons and continue our our Bible study even though we're continuing to be in this time of, of uh, pandemic and uh, social isolation and uh, trying to to take care of ourselves during this uh, this this time of, of, of our virus so lesson nine from Hebrews will come from the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews today. So if you have your Bibles, open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, and we'll make reference to a verse there that we find in, in the context of uh, that great uh, chapter on faith. Let us begin our study here with a word of prayer. O oh God, our God and our Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to address you as our Father in heaven. We thank you for your grace and mercy that you've shown us, and we pray that you'll continue to extend that grace and mercy to us in keeping with your will. We pray forgiveness of our sins, and we ask your blessings on us as we open your word and study from this great book of Hebrews today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to begin here today with a uh, with a pledge, and I'll see if you recognize this pledge. Those of you who are, um, well, I started to say those of you that are my age might recognize it, but I think the I, I actually think it's still a pretty active organization. So here's the pledge: I pledge my head to clearer thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service and my health to better living for my club, my community, my country, and my world. Do you recognize that pledge? Some of you may remember it. Uh, it's the 4-H club pledge. And in that pledge, we've made reference to the head, the heart, the hands, and health. That's the 4-H's. The 4-H Club is an organization that's been around for many, many years, and it, it, it's designed to help kids grow into productive citizens. Now, the reason I know it's been around for many years is because uh, I was a part of the 4-H Club when I was in elementary school. And in fact, it's kind of... Um, uh, it's kind of neat that Ter Teresa, my wife, and I were talking one day about our elementary years, and the 4-H club came up, and we both decided, now we didn't grow up in the same town, we grew up in, in, in separate communities, and went to separate schools in elementary school, didn't know one another really in elementary school, high school, but when we began to talk about the 4-H club, we we decided and determined that she and I both served as presidents of our 4-H clubs when we were in the fifth grade. So anyway, that's just kind of been a little interesting uh, tidbit for uh, for us. But today's lesson is in, entitled the 4-H club. Now, I didn't give that to you initially because I wanted to see if you recognized that pledge that we opened our our study together with. But again, those four H's, the head, the heart, the hands, and health will be the, the focus of our lesson today. Now, there are strong spiritual lessons surrounding uh, those four H's. And uh, since we're studying lessons from the book of Hebrews, then I thought we would take a verse out of the 11th chapter of Hebrews today, and we will address some of these H's that we're talking about here. I want, I want our lesson to text today to be Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, wherein the Bible says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Now there's 
kind of a di direct reference made uh, to Noah with respect to his head, his heart, and his hands in this in this verse. And we'll talk about those, and that that'll be really the crux of our les the lesson today. And and though not directly stated, there's there's a reference to his health as well, or it's certainly implied, because Noah would have had to be a very healthy man in order to complete the tasks of um, preparing that ark. So we're going to talk about these uh, these four concepts a little bit. Let's talk about that idea of of health just very briefly here, and then we're going to get into. Uh, the other three H's that we see with respect to, to Noah. As far as health goes, in the third epistle of John, John prayed that the recipients would prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. John prayed for them to prosper in all areas, and in particular, he asked for them to have good health. It's interesting that he he said, I, I wish you would have health uh, in relation to how your soul, how healthy your soul is. Uh, I wonder how many of us would be willing to, to, to pray that as well and want our physical health to be in, in proportion to our spiritual health. But it, nonetheless, uh, that's what John prayed for there in that third epistle. And actually, that's the only time in the New Testament that the word health appears. Um, now, there are other places that, that the idea is brought up, like 1 Timothy 4, 8, when Paul tells the young preacher Timothy that exercise profits a little. Uh, so uh, exercise, health, and that kind of thing. So our health is, is truly a, a blessing, and without good health, our service to God is certainly limited, and we want to we wanna note that. But for our purposes today, let's leave health on the table there, and let's focus on the other three ideas. That is the head, the heart, and the hands. Now, I want to make a connection here with these three as far as what we normally would associate with the head, the heart, and the hands. Uh, we would associate the head with, with thinking. We would associate the heart with our feelings, our emotions, and we associate the hands with, with doing. So as we talk about the head, the heart, and the hands today, we'll make a regular reference to these three ideas of think, feel, and do. And scripture actually speaks of all three of these areas uh, being associated with the heart. When you, when you see the heart in scripture, you're not you're not always talking about the organ that pumps our blood here in, in our in our chest cavity, but but you're talking about the seat of of, of our thinking and emotions and etc. And as a matter of fact, these three areas, the head, the heart, the hands, think, feel, and do, uh, we'll see them in in scripture like the intellect. With the heart, we think. We reason, we believe. Number two, the emotions. With the heart, we feel, we love, we hope, we desire. And lastly, with the heart, we can associate that with the will. And with the heart, we intend, or we actually obey, or we do. So again, we're talking about the head, the heart, the hands. We're talking about think feel and do. We're talking about the intellect, the emotions, and the will. So let's, let's, uh, let's explore that here just a little bit, and we'll, we'll come to appreciate the 4-H pledge even more when we talk about I pledge my head to clearer thinking and my heart to, uh, to greater loyalty and my hands to larger service. See that clearer thinking, that's the thinking my heart to greater loyalty, that's the, the feeling aspect, and my hands to greater service, that's the doing part of it. So what does the Bible say about each one of these components here? Well, there are a lot of verses you could, you could uh, bring into the discussion, but what came to my mind first was, as far as the thinking goes, is Proverbs 23, 7. 
wherein we read, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. See, with the heart, we think. That's the intellectual component. Number two, we could associate the heart also in the feeling aspect here with, uh, we could cross-reference Matthew 22, 37. A lot of different verses, but this one came to my mind where it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. We love with the heart. That's an emotion, see? So that's the emotional component. We think with, uh, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And then it says, uh, love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And then lastly, as far as the will or the doing or the action component here, uh, we could use Romans 6, 17 for that, where uh, Paul said to the Romans, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you've obeyed from the heart. With the heart, see, we do, we obey. That's the active or the action component there as well. And that's the will component. And as a matter of fact, if you re read on Romans chapter six, if you went into the next chapter, in Romans chapter 7, verse 15, Paul says, for what I will to do, what I will to do. Well, the point we're making here is the intellect, the emotion, and the will, the head, the heart, the hands, thinking and feeling and doing, all of those, the Bible seats all of that, or, or at least connects all of that to our heart. With the man, with the with the uh, for a man, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Yet you've obeyed from the heart. And those are the three components here that we're actually talking about out of our out of our um, areas in in that 4-H pledge. So we've got the head, the heart, and the hands. We feel, we think, we feel, and we do. That's the intellect, the emotion, and the will. So sometimes I wonder how could those who we otherwise would consider to be doctrinally sound, how could they just suddenly or over time, how could they leave the faith and end up in error? Sometimes we wonder how, how are children that's raised in the truth that when they get when they're when they're grown, they leave the faith and they forsake the faith. And how 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 uh, how does that happen? I, I think I told you one time earlier that I I know of a person who, who was a member of the Lord's Church for many many years and had all the the signs of being uh, grounded doctrinally, and that person left the faith and is now a practicing Jehovah's Witness. And so how, one just wonders there, how does this happen? And maybe part of that can be can can lead back to what we're discussing today. Maybe maybe the answer is found in our discussion, particularly in the level of knowledge. There are different levels of knowledge, and I'd like for us to. We've talked about these three components of the heart, and 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 I'd like for us to um, consider how that ties into three levels of learning here as as well. I remember in my college years when I was preparing for a career in education, I was introduced to something called Bloom's taxonomy of three learning domains. And you're talking about how to teach and how people learn and and uh uh so here's a very important and here's a very important concept that's taught in the um, in the school of education in, in preparing people to be to be school teachers, and that is Bloom's taxonomy of three learning domains. And here they are: number one is the cognitive domain, number two is the affective domain, and number three is the psychomotor domain. There are three different domains or three different components here as far as learning. There's the cognitive domain, there's the affective domain, and the psychomotor domain. Well, you can, you can imagine that we're about to tie those three domains into the discussion we're having here about the head, the heart, and the hands. 
Matter of fact, that's exactly what I want to do at this point. The cognitive. If you see the word cognitive, you might you might see recognition. You might see the root word for recognition in, in cognitive. The, the word cognitive here has to do with knowledge. It's what we know. The word affective is what we feel. That's the our attitude, if you will. And then the word psychomotor has to do with what we do. That's our skills or actions. So you see the perfect tie in with what we're talking about here, the cognitive, cognitive having to do with the head, the affective having to do with the heart, and the psychomotor having to do with the uh, with the hand. So I think that you'll you'll see that uh, those are, are obvious ties into what we're doing what we're talking about today. No, feel, and do. Now let's consider that in light of our text here in in uh, Hebrews chapter eleven, verse seven, and wherein we see that Noah. Well, let's just read it again together. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. So uh, the warning, let's look by faith, Noah being divinely warned. The warning here, see, uh, required a cognitive level of understanding. That involved something that God told him, and it was just factual. It was just a level of, of knowledge that, that Noah had there. And then, then after he received that warning, there was something that he had, that knowledge that he had, that produced in him faith, and, and that, that he believed it. And he uh, there was something that he knew. Then that knowledge moved him Read on with me. The warning of things not yet seen moved with godly fear. It moved him to, to the affective domain here or an emotional aspect of it. He moved with fear. This is the affective domain. And then read on. So uh, he moved with godly fear. He prepared an ark. Now we're moving into the action or the psychomotor domain here and to the will component or the, the, the doing comes into play. So we have, uh, we have three things here all in verse 7. And you might want to mark them. You know in times past that I've told you that I mark in my, in my Bibles things that help me remember later on. And so if you are so inclined, then here's what you might want to do. Circle the word warned and the word fear and the word prepared. Now I've got a number one beside warned, number two beside fear, and a number three beside prepared. And out in the margin of my Bible, my marginal note, number one is intellect, number two is emotion, and number three is will. So you have these three levels or these three domains of learning here and you have all three of them tied perfectly in with what we initially started our discussion with today as far as uh, the head and the, hand, uh, the heart and the hands. The intellect, the head, as a man thinks in his heart. Uh, fear, the emotion, the affective domain. And both of those, the intellect, the, the knowledge moved him to an emotional involvement here that uh, was the affective and both of them together then moved him to act which is the psychomotor domain all three of them being involved in in uh in this so uh, there's your marginal note for the for the bible study today now i want to bring in one more uh component here of our lesson that i think will tie in with this and again, we, th we started with the head, the heart, and the hands, with the think, the feel, the do, uh, the, uh, the cognitive domain, the affective domain, and the psychomotor domain. We'll just put that on hold for just a moment here, and let's bring in another uh, discussion point here for our lesson. And that is, there are three aspects of the gospel 
that I'd like to uh, like for us to know. Three aspects, and you, you can imagine that we'll tie those three aspects to uh, what we're discussing here today. But the three aspects, the three components, if you will, of the gospel are number one is are facts, number two is promises. And number three are commands, facts, promises, and commands. So now let's talk about those. With facts, facts, factual, knowledge, we, th we think, we believe, we reason those things out. And so the gospel, one component or one aspect of the gospel is factual. See, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. If you wanted to look back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we normally associate 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with the, as the resurrection chapter, but I love the first four verses of that because it gives us a definition of the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, Glenn, the gospel is good news. It is. Euangelion is the, is the Greek word for that, and uh, it, it, that's true. But let's describe the gospel a little further. Moreover, brethren, I declare you the gospel, Paul says, which I preach to you, which also you receive, and in which you stand, by which also you're saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. Now here it is, verse 3 and 4. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and he was buried and that he arose again the third day, according to the scriptures. What is the gospel? The gospel is factual information that is nothing more than the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. So, all right. So we're talking about uh, facts. The gospel facts. Well, see, you don't, uh, you don't, you don't obey facts. You believe facts. You believe that factual. That's the intellect part of it. Number two, the second aspect of the gospel are the promises. Promises are, are it's going to be factual. If God promised it, it's going to come to pass, but it's not factual now. It's a promise. Now, these pro promises are, are what we hope and we hold on to. The forgiveness of sins. The hope of eternal life. You see, this is clearly the emotional aspect of the gospel. We've got the intellectual aspect of the gospel that are facts. Now we've got the emotional aspect of the gospel, which are promises. Now listen to the, some of these promises. James 1, 12. The crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who obey him. James 2, 5. Heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him. Titus 1-2, eternal life, which God promised before the time began. In 2 Peter 1-4, Peter reminds us that we've been given exceedingly great and precious promises. So these promises are what we, we hold on to with our emotion or the affective domain there. That's, that's, that's the heart. That's, what, that's the hope that we have, that if we remain faithful, there's a crown of life that's laid up for us, Revelation 2.10. So those are promises. So we've got facts. You don't obey facts. You've got promises. You don't obey promises. But there's a third aspect of the gospel, and that, that uh, those are commands. And you do obey the, uh, the commands, see? So uh, we referenced earlier Romans 6, 17, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. See, that's the aspect of, uh, of, of doing. That's the psychomotor part. That's the active part here. There are facts that we believe were given and we, we think about them and we believe them. And then involved in the gospel are promises that God has made to us that we hold on to emotionally, and that's what sustains us emotionally. And then that leads us to wanting to obey. And that's the active part, the psychomotor part 
the will part. You know, what, what came to my mind as I was putting our lesson together here is uh, Acts 3.27, uh, where uh, Acts 2.37, I'm sorry, Acts 2.37, where uh, at the end of that great sermon in, in Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter had, had, had affected them emotionally and, and stirred them emotionally with all of this factual information. But verse 37 is a key to our discussion today when it says, uh, the, uh, they, they said to Peter uh, and, the, and, the, and the other apostles, they said, men and brethren, what shall we, what? What shall we do? What shall we do? See, their, their intellect and their emotion had led them into the active part of that as well. And of course, uh, Peter told them, he said, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the remission of sins. So we believe, we hope, we obey. We think, we feel, we act, or we do. We believe the facts. We hope for the promises, we obey the commands. And so we believe with our intellect. That's so one of the great things here that I love about uh, the, uh, the gospel and faith. You know, Hebrews chapter 11 is where we are. And, and, and that's sometimes referred to as the great faith chapter. And I love the way it starts in, in verse one. Now faith is the substance, the foundation of things hoped for, the evidence. See, that's the tangible thing, evidence. I don't want, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I don't just have a blind faith. I've got evidence. I've got tangible uh, demonstrations to make the foundation of, of what I believe here. And that's, uh, that's the reason that I, I love the uh, I love God's word so much is because there's just so much evidence in there. And and all of this see, plays right into uh, to our discussion today. We're talking about uh, facts and promises and commands. We're talking about the head, the heart, and the hands. We're talking about we think and we feel and we do. I remember one time that Wendell Winkler, uh, a dear friend of mine for many years, uh, told me, uh, I, I, I made this statement one time. He says, if you teach a Bible class, and I've taught a Bible class now probably going on 35 years. And he was in that class for, for a number of years and was one of the great, one of the greatest encouragers of, uh, of mine in, in my past. But I remember this statement that Wendell made one time. He said, if you teach a Bible class, there are three things you need to remember. He said, three things you need to always remember uh, in teaching a Bible class, and that is the head, the heart, and the hands. Exactly what we talked about today. He said, the head, what to know. You need to teach, and part of it needs to be what, what to know, knowledge. But the heart, the, uh, your, your people in your class need to also leave with, with a feeling. You need to affect them emotionally. They need to know what to feel, and then they also need to know what to do. There needs to be an application por uh, portion of it as well. So uh, I, need to, I need to remember that and do a better job of incorporating all of those into classes that we, that we have. But So as I bring our lesson to a close today, in the academia circles, Benjamin Bloom came up with his three ideas, the, the, the taxonomy of three learning domains around the, uh, the year of 1950. Several years later was when I was introduced to those ideas in, uh, in, in, uh, in college and, and it was just like, those are great, great things. I mean, that was a, a great, um, discovery or whatever that, that, that he made there with that. But <laughs> the cognitive, the affective, and the psychomotor domains, alas, we see it in scripture 2,000 years earlier than that. If you pick up Hebrews chapter 11 and read of Noah in verse uh, 7, 
you will see that he was presented with facts about a coming flood and then it affected him uh, emotionally here and it all uh, led him to, uh, to action in the psycho, psychomotor domain. So I began our class today with uh, the 4-H pledge. I pledge my head to clearer thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my help to better living for my club, my community, my country, and my world. I want to tweak that pledge just a little bit as we close our thoughts today. I want to pledge my heart, my head, my hands, and my health to use for greater service to the greatest cause of all time. And I hope you have that same commitment in your heart and in your life as well. Thank you so much for being with us today. Our ninth lesson of Hebrews entitled The 4-H Club. I look forward to being with you again very soon. Thank you.